will go directly to uh, our third speaker, um, David Moore, uh, who is a, a former member of uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee, um, a scholar of international law, human rights, foreign relations law, and international development. So his scholarship has appeared in leading journals such as the Harvard, Columbia, and Virginia, Virginia Law Reviews. In 2020, he served a brief term on the UN Human Rights Committee, and from two. 2017-2019, uh, he worked as, at the U.S. Agency for International Development as Acting Deputy Administrator and General Counsel. He previously uh, he clerked for Justice Samuel Alito Jr. and on, uh, on the U.S. Supreme Court. He's currently so uh, the, the Sterling and Eleanor Colton end of chair in law and, and associate director of the International Center for Law and Religious Studies. Uh, at uh, Brigham Young University Law School. So he will discuss the interdeterminacy of uh, positive law of human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Ligia Monsignor, for the invitation to be here. Um, my remarks uh, relate closely to Professor Silva, so uh, maybe they'll provide some voice to what he was um, saying. So let me begin by um, expressing my uh, firm belief in the dignity of the human person, um, my, my uh, sense that human rights are an important mechanism for achieving um, human dignity and human rights institutions as well. Um, but the, the, the um, respect for human dignity through human rights is so important that uh, we need to be critical um, and uh, work to improve and ensure these are, are not interfering, uh, for example, with, with human rights. So um, I want to uh, approach my topic in that context uh, and within our uh, framing of, uh, of this conference with its focus on the natural law um, and um, talk about the, oh, thank you, um, the, one of the challenges of the human rights system uh, is its indeterminacy, which we've, we've talked about in, in various ways um, already in this, this conference. But, but this is a, perhaps the grand critique of natural law, that it is indeterminate. Right? Um, uh, Aquinas recognized um, that Um, uh, Aquinas recognized uh, this critique um, as exemplified by this quote, to the natural law belongs everything to which a man is inclined according to his nature. But different men are naturally inclined to different things, some to the desire of pleasures, others to the desire of honors, uh, and other men to other things. There is, therefore, there is not one natural law for all. Now, important to recognize Aquinas was recognizing this as a critique that is made. It was not adopting um, or endorsing um, this critique. But certainly, uh, the, the critique of natural law is often its indeterminacy, both in methods, whether it's through reason uh, and what forms of reason or revelation um, to identify the natural law, and certainly um, indeterminacy as to the conclusions of what uh, is embodied in the natural law. Um, my point is that we see this same indeterminacy in the positive law of, of human rights. Um, the international law enterprise, certainly the, the uh, subset of that enterprise of, of human rights, um, is built on the, the positive law tradition, or I guess I should say its framework is, is certainly positivist. It has deep roots, I think, in natural law, um, and, and we see that in the evolution uh, of, of modern international human rights, but modern international law is, is a positivist enterprise. As we looked at the sources of international law, at least formally, uh, as we look at the sources of international law, when we talk about treaties, these agreements consented to by authorized representatives or customary international law, practices that states engage in because they feel legally obligated to do so. Um, even uh, this secondary source of international law, general principles, derives from uh, laws or, or, or norms adopted in the legal system, the positive legal systems of states' parties. 
Um, the one source of international law that looks much more like uh, natural law is, is, is this notion of use cogens, that there are certain norms that cannot be consented around, right? So there, there is um, a, a strong natural law representation in, in that source. But as I mentioned, um, the development of modern international human rights does not depart from this positivist framework on which um, international law is built. Um, with the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which sort of launched the modern international human rights movement, obviously it's a, de a declaration of uh, authorized uh, states um, to recognize human rights. We see probably more natural law in this document, the notion that this, these rights derive from uh, liberty, um, that this is sort of a declaration or maybe recognition of, of principles that might exist uh, without this, this declaration. But as we progress, um, the, the development of international human law becomes more positivist as treaties like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights uh, and the ICSCR are adopted, um, and then the seven other core international human rights treaties that have uh, followed on a variety of, of human rights topics. One of the interesting things, I think, in this development is that there is even positive law to guide the interpretation of these sources of, of international law. Um, and so, whereas we have this critique of natural law that it's indeterminate, that it's easy to reach different conclusions, there is international law um, that constrains, or at least uh, purports to constrain, how um, uh, international human rights treaties are, and, and treaties generally, are interpreted. So, in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, we get... Um, two articles that uh, dictate how treaties are to be interpreted in, in, under international law. Um, and uh, this doesn't totally uh, prevent indeterminacy, partly because the, the Vienna Convention lists, lists so many considerations that might play into the interpretation of, of treaties. And I won't uh, look at the, the specific language, but sort of um, summarize it here. Uh, start with ordinary meaning of the text, um, but also uh, the international law of treaty interpretation directs looking at context, and context is very broad. It's not only the preambulatory provisions of a treaty, um, it's also other agreements uh, or instruments that are adopted by the state's parties. Um, the object and purpose of the treaty is also a legitimate consideration in identifying its its meaning, um, other agreements that states later enter or practices that they later adopt can also influence our interpretation of treaties as can other applicable provisions of, of international law. So it's something of a grab bag, right? But, um, but it is constrained. There, there are at least factors that are uh, to be considered um, and that are legitimized as uh, considerations in interpreting treaties. Um, of course, the interpretation, as we've heard, often occurs at these uh, treaty bodies. Each of the nine uh, international human rights treaties has at least one uh, treaty body um, that engages in um, interpretation of their human rights treaty in a variety of, of ways. Um, so they receive reports from states as to their compliance with the treaty and then issue uh, observations on on uh, how the state is performing under the treaty and engage in treaty interpretation in that exercise. Um, they issue general comments. We've heard general comment um, uh, 36 referenced um, where they interpret particular provisions of a treaty and, and are directly involved uh, in interpretation there. Um, they receive individual communications, uh, claims of a violation of um, their international human rights treaty from individuals as to states who have consented to this process, and in that uh, uh, responsibility are also involved in uh, treaty interpretation. Um, 
in this process, uh, again, there is a governing body of international law, a positive body of law to guide this, this uh, responsibility and this um, uh, interpretation of the treaties. And what I want to do is look at um, the, the Human Rights Committee's uh, interpretation of two provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, to demonstrate that notwithstanding, and this is not surprising, right, but notwithstanding uh, this positive law of treaty interpretation, the committee does not uh, follow uh, the international law of treaty interpretation. There's something else uh, going on. Um, and I've chosen a couple of examples that I ran into in my very brief term on the Human Rights Committee. Um, but, but examples that are deliberately controversial uh, because I think it's in those controversial interpretations that we're most likely to see the, the committee's commitments, right? Um, is it committed to the positive law of treaty interpretation? Are there other things that are really the underlying commitments when those uh, controversial issues arise or that sort of displays um, those underlying uh, commitments? Um, so the first uh, provision that I want to look at is in Article 2, which describes or sets the scope of states' human rights obligations under the ICCPR and says that states' parties are bound to respect the rights in the covenant as to individuals within their territory and subject to their jurisdiction. Um, over the course of time, the committee has uh, interpreted this provision uh, increasingly broadly. So initially, uh, the committee interpreted and to mean it or, right? To interpret this in the disjunctive, that it was territory or jurisdiction of the state. Um, then uh, th when it refers to jurisdiction, this could be within the power or effective control of um, the state. And in a case um, more recently uh, that was decided while I was on, on the committee, um, the, the committee went even further to conclude that uh, a state or an individual could be within a state's territory or jurisdiction if there was a special relation of dependency between that individual and the state. Uh, and so you see, um, again, this broadening of this understanding of the reach of states obligations. So this was a case against Italy. It was a very tragic case. Um, there were about 100, or actually around 200 refugees fleeing Syria um, who perished in a shipwreck in the Mediterranean. And their survivors brought a claim under the ICCPR right to life against Italy. Um, the accident had occurred obviously outside Italy's territory. It occurred on the high seas. Um, by convention, the high seas are, are divided into search and rescue zones. The accident occurred in Malta's rather than Italy's search and rescue zone. Um, but the committee nonetheless found that uh, this accident had occurred within Italy's territory or jurisdiction because of a special relationship of dependency that had uh, arisen between those who uh, perished in the accident and, and the state of Italy. Factually uh, grounded in the fact that the first distress call came to Italy, uh, the Rome Coordination Center uh, stayed involved, and perhaps most significantly, there was an Italian vessel, Navy vessel, that was relatively close to the accident and could have arrived much more quickly um, and um, uh, saved those who, who ultimately perished. Legally, the committee recognized that outside the ICCPR, there are duties on states to act reasonably in response to distress calls, to cooperate in rescue efforts. And based on these facts and um, legal obligations, again, not arriving from the ICCPR, the committee found this special relationship of dependency such that Italy did have uh, ICCPR obligations uh, in this situation and had, had violated them by not responding uh, more quickly um, to, to the accident. Um, when you, um, oh, excuse me, just go back. 
it's hard to square this conclusion with the international law of treaty interpretation, where we look at already meaning of words like territory or jurisdiction, um, when we look at um, other principles of international law, which have divided the high seas into search and rescue zones, and this was not within Italy's, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's a fairly clear example where the committee does not follow the positive law of um, international treaty interpretation. Um, and seems to be motivated by normative considerations. Um, and I don't want to disparage those. I think all of us would agree, right, uh, as a normative matter, I Italy, under these facts, could and should have done more. Um, but as a matter of treaty interpretation, um, this, uh, it's hard to conclude that Italy had um, legal obligations under the treaty. Um, turning to a second provision where you see this um, uh, departure from the positive law of treaty interpretation and reliance more on normative considerations, um, the treaty guarantees the right to life. Right? That everyone uh, has the inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived. Um, the committee has interpreted this in two ways that I think, and perhaps others, but I'll focus on two, two ways that uh, demonstrate again this indeterminacy of positive law, the fact that the, the positive law of treaty interpretation is not followed in understanding the positive law commitments of the ICCPR. Um, so uh, in the first instance, uh, the committee has interpreted the right to life very broadly. Um, and essentially recognized uh, a right to life with dignity. Again, this is not normatively bad in, in any sort of way, right? Um, but it is not uh, consistent with the positive law of interpretation. And so um, the committee has interpreted the right to life uh, to include things like a right to sexual uh, education, nuclear nonproliferation, uh, state obligation to respond to traffic problems, uh, et cetera. So it's interpreted this very, very broadly. Again, hard to square this with the international law of treaty interpretation. Uh, the ordinary meaning of the text that everyone has a right to life um, would uh, f uh, seem to, to direct us, uh, particularly in, in, when we turn to context, to issues of deprivation of life. And that is not a small matter. Um, Obviously, deprivation of life by states remains a serious problem. Um, and so it is, it's, it's not um, trivializing, I think, this guarantee uh, to, to, to recognize that its focus is on this question of, of deprivation. Again, the ordinary meaning um, looks like focus on deprivation, not quality of life. Other parts of article, um, uh, this article focus on the death penalty and genocide, right? Again, suggesting this is not a, a provision about quality, but on um, the, the guarantee to live uh, and not to be subject to the death penalty or uh, to, to genocide. Um, certainly, the preamble, and as we've recognized, these rights derive from the notion of human dignity, um, so that's part of the relevant context, uh, but it is one thing to consider it as context and another to make the context the right, um, as is in this uh, case. Um, similarly, if we look at other agreement states have entered, like the ICSCR, um, there's evidence that states thought this right to life was not meant to address all um, aspects of life that could lead to a life with dignity. Um, uh, and so there's, uh, again, a sense that these uh, other treaties um, uh, support the notion that this is a much more limited uh, guarantee than the, the committee has, has recognized. Um, and so illustrates and a failure to follow this law of treaty interpretation and um, uh, appears to be motivated by noble but inconsistent with uh, positive law desires to expand human rights to address um, uh, dignity more, more generally. Um, more particularly, the right to life uh, has been in interpreted by the committee as has been mentioned to include a right to abortion. Um, and again, uh, it is, I think, impossible to square this interpretation with the international law of treaty interpretation. Uh, if we look at the text, at the ordinary meaning, right, the right to life, um, that 
The language of life is uh, the, the language that is uh, anti-abortion, right? Choice and life are sort of the ways we frame things, certainly in the United States, but I think uh, globally we see that. And so the ordinary meaning, obviously, of the right to life would not uh, support a right to abortion. Um, the words every, inherent, right, also suggest um, that uh, the right to life does not guarantee uh, abortion. The, as I mentioned, the article goes on to prohibit um, the death penalty and specifically to prevent application of the death penalty against pregnant women. This ties in, I think, Professor Brammer's comments on wrongful death, et cetera, this, um, uh, these other provisions that suggest that there is a life uh, and a right that begins uh, before uh, conception. Um, you look at other uh, uh, provisions as well. The purpose, uh, again, seems to be focusing on preventing deprivation, not um, um, facilitating deprivation of, of life. Um, other agreements like the ICSCR talk about the highest attainable standard of health, including um, in reducing child mortality, for example. Um, and so as we uh, broaden from text, as the positive law of treaty interpretation does to context, uh, to pr state practice, et cetera, um, all those um, indicate that this interpretation of um, the ICCPR is not consistent with, um, with the law of treaty interpretation. Um, uh, I hadn't pointed out, we didn't pause to, to, to uh, focus on this, but the law of treaty interpretation allows um, resort to the travaux preparatoires, sort of the legislative history of treaties in limited circumstances um, to confirm a meaning that's been uh, reached by the other considerations. Um, uh, and when, when you look at the travaux preparatoire for the ICCPR, um, there, was, there were proposals to guarantee that the right to life begins at conception. These didn't make it into um, the, the treaty, um, but there were no proposals to guarantee a right to, to abortion in the ICCPR. And so that travaux preparatoire, with these other considerations, again, make it clear that this interpretation um, is not consistent with uh, positive law. Um, let me just quickly, I'm uh, out of time. What, what's going on, again, I think uh, normative, uh, the, the desire to reach certain normative ends is, is driving uh, the work of the, the committee uh, in lots of ways. Uh, this is understandable. It's hard to change human rights. It's hard to get new human rights treaties. And so um, there is a pr pressure to reach an end through, through a shortcut. Um, but that comes with costs. Um, it comes of co with costs to the international rule of law. Um, it comes with cost to uh, future participation, respect for the international human rights system. And I think for purposes of uh, our theme today, right, um, undermines this notion that positive law I mean, is a superior way to approach uh, human rights. Um, that it's superior to natural law because natural law is so indeterminate. It illustrates that um, the p positive law of human rights is subject to this criticism as well uh, in ways that uh, are, are very concerning. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Mou. Uh, I've mentioned yesterday briefly Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, and it makes me think about that uh, when he predicted in uh, democracy in America that uh, excesses of democracy would lead to uh, a tyranny of majority over minority through the judicial system. But now we see something different uh, that's going on, which is a, a, a tyranny of minorities over majorities and the tyranny of ideologies of a, major, a, a minority who is leading the whole West through specifically the judicial system. And uh, these discussions really make me think about that. And, and uh, I think it is a uh, food for thoughts and then after for our, our discussions. Um, 